Ladies and gentlemen, right here we have the Radeon 7. This is AMD's transition from their previous flagship Vega 64 going from 14 nanometer down to 7 nanometer with this new flagship right here. And today we're going to be comparing it against the RTX 2070, RTX 2080. I'll even throw in some extra graphics cards like the Vega 64 and the 1080 Ti. And with that said, I'll also try to be overclocking this thing and then I'll overclock the RTX 2070. And I'm gonna make a point of comparing this against not only the RTX 2080, but also the RTX 2070, because there's something to come out of this review where it's gonna be probably one of the weirdest recommendations because I'm going to be testing it 21 by nine as suggested by you guys in the previous unboxing video. And I'm also gonna be testing out Resident Evil 2, Crisis 3, which also got a lot of upvotes, Forza 4, and also Shadow of the Tomb Raider. And with that said, let's get straight into it with those benchmarks for you guys. Welcome back to Tech yes City, and let's get on with those numbers straight away. Resident Evil 2 will pull up this benchmark. This was the best case scenario for the Radeon 7 in today's benchmark numbers, uh, beating out that of the 2080 and also the 2070 overclocked. Now, it is important to notice with these overclocked figures, I did put quotation marks around them because the numbers when I overclocked were virtually the same as not overclocking, and that's because I just simply couldn't extract basically any more performance out of the Radeon 7. It's like it had a mind of its own where it would have found its sweet spot straight out of the box. Now, this is an odd thing. I did manage to increase the power limit 5%, but if I try to overclock the memory, even just a slight bit, but also even the clock speed, say for instance, 30 megahertz in the uh, Radeon Wattman software, I just couldn't get anything out of it. Even pushing the fan speeds to 100%, which we'll talk about that later with thermals and noise, we just really couldn't get anything out of this card in terms of overclocks. But irregardless of that, Resident Evil 2 was a good showing that I guess shows the potential of the Radeon 7 card. Moving over now to Hitman 2, this was on the other end of the spectrum. And here we can see that the 2070 was even beating out the Radeon 7 when it wasn't even overclocked. So the 2080 is well ahead, but the 2070 not even overclocked shouldn't be beating out the Radeon 7. So perhaps, uh, AMD still have to optimize their card for this particular title. But now pulling up Battlefield 5 for you guys, this game does perform better in DX11 than it does in DX12. So we're gonna keep that DX11 option ticked on here. 21 by nine ultra wide 1440p numbers with the max settings at ultra here on the presets show that the Radeon 7 was kind of again falling behind the 2070 when the 2070 was overclocked. And now it is important for me when I do these overclock numbers, I like to include them because in the case of the 2070, it's easy to get that extra performance out of it. And there's a lot of cards that are coming in even cheaper than the Founders Editions, especially in Australia, that you can overclock and the noise levels won't even be that loud. In particular, this Galax card that I have here right on the desk. The 2080 is pulling ahead in this title comfortably, but the Vega 64 card is a long shot behind the Radeon 7. So it is good to see that AMD is now sort of keeping up with the bunch of new cards from Nvidia. But now moving on to Forza Horizon 4, 1440p ultra wide numbers, max settings on the dial. We use the in-house benchmark here. And this was where the RTX 2080 was pulling ahead slightly, same with the 1080 Ti, uh, but the 2070 overclocked was sort of catching up to the Radeon 7. So perhaps in this title does need a little bit more optimization, but the Radeon 7, again, was pulling far ahead of its predecessor, the Vega 64. So that is good to see that this new card from AMD, again, just like the previous titles, is still packing some punches. Now, next up here is Rainbow Six Siege, an online competitive multiplayer title, ultra settings, 1440p ultra wide again, We've got the 2070 actually pulling ahead when it's not even overclocked. And then when it's overclocked, it gets even a bigger gain with that, the 2080 and then the 2080 Ti coming even more ahead than the 2070. So this wasn't a good result for the Radeon 7. But now moving on to that much requested title from you guys, Crisis 3, 2070 is falling behind the Radeon 7 and the 2080 is pulling ahead just by a bit. But the overclocked 2070 is starting to pull just a little bit ahead 
of Radeon 7 in this benchmark as well. Next up here we have Far Cry 5 and the Radeon 7 was coming second best here, only being surpassed by the 2080 Ti. So it was beating the 2080 1080 Ti and RTX 2070 even when that was overclocked. And then the last title we had up here was Shadow of the Tomb Raider DX12 high settings 1440p ultra wide. Radeon 7 was uh, beating out a 1080 Ti and also the 2070 overclocked and not overclocked. 2080 just pulling ever so slightly ahead of our new brethren from the seven nanometer dimension right here. And then pulling up lastly, some uh, synthetics for you guys, 3D Mark Fire Strike, and then also Time Spy Extreme uh, showed us some uh, decent numbers, especially coming well ahead of that of the Vega 64 from the previous generation. Now on that note of the previous generation, Vega 64 and Vega 56 for that matter, they were capped by the HBM uh, bandwidth and the speeds more specifically. In this case, Radeon 7, when you overclock the memory, I feel it's not gonna make much of a difference, even though when I try to overclock the memory, it just crashed. Uh, this time around, they've doubled the memory from eight gigabytes of HBM2 to 16 gigabytes of HBM2. And the big thing is here, people are probably like, that's a lot of memory, it's probably too much. Uh, yes, I do agree, I think it's a lot of memory to put on a $700 graphics card, but at the same time, it does have a purpose, and that is to actually double the bandwidth too on this graphics card versus the predecessors, the Vega 64, for example. Because in this case with HBM2, since it does stack, it opens it up to a 4096 bit wide bus on the memory interface. So that enables that, I think, breathing room for the HBM to perform better when we saw in the previous generation with Vega 64 and Vega 56, especially when you started overclocking that HBM memory, you saw some big performance gains as opposed to the actual clock speeds of the GPU itself. So even though the GPU is about 200 megahertz higher, it's performing a lot better because I feel that they've stacked that eight gigabytes up to 16 gigabytes and they're reaping the performance benefits this time around. And also on top of that, the reason why they're able to double up the memory is because they've shrunk down the die size from 495 millimeters squared down to 331 millimeters squared, thanks to the seven nanometer process that they're using this time around, which also increases the transistor count ever so slightly from 12.5 billion to 13.2 billion on Radeon 7. However, the one ironic thing versus Vega 64 is that they've reduced the stream processes from 4,096 down to 3,840. So now all the previous benefits we've just discussed are pretty much to solely thank to the TSMC seven nanometer node that they are using. Going from 14 nanometer to seven nanometer is a huge drop. And with that, we're gonna see a power efficiency on the increase as well. However, the Vega 64 card uh, does still consume about the same amount of power as the Radeon 7. It's just that the Radeon 7 performs a lot better. So it is good to see that this uh, new design here on Radeon 7 isn't doing too bad as opposed to Vega 64, for instance, which came well under a 1080 Ti in terms of performance, but in turn used a bit more power than the 1080 Ti. So it was kind of surprised to see that the Radeon 7 is not doing too bad but one important thing to note is that Nvidia hasn't dropped their process down yet. So that is still a sleeve that they have up their hands as opposed to AMD using it now with Radeon 7. But that's enough of me babbling. Let's talk about this graphics card itself. It weighs in at 1.3 kilos, comes in at around 27 centimeters long, is a dual slot card, also features a backplate and a Radeon logo that lights up as well as the red little cube on the side that lights up with it. It requires two eight pin power connectors. And then on the rear, you get three DisplayPort 1.4s and a HDMI 2 out. The 80mm fans also make this card so much better than the previous reference Vega 64 and Vega 56 models, allowing it to get only 30 decibels on idle with 23% fan speeds measured roughly in the global Wattman, and then testing it out in Unigine Heaven with full stress, saw us get 58% fan speeds with 46 decibels of noise, reaching a temperature of 70 degrees Celsius. Now the room temperature on ambience was 26 degrees Celsius, stepping it up to 60% fan speeds manual, saw 47 decibels, 69 degrees, then 80% saw 64 degrees Celsius, 56 decibels, and then max speeds was pretty much unbearable, 100% fan speeds, 59 decibels, 61 degrees Celsius. So the sweet spot for this card is around 60%. I'm guessing that's pretty much all fans implemented on graphics cards uh, start to hit a inefficiency curve in terms of noise and actual performance after 60%. We're seeing this again on this graphics card, 
not just with the auto profile, but also with the manual 60% fan speeds. So the last test I wanted to do for you guys was when I was at CES, I noticed AMD made a point of testing productivity numbers and saying that they uh, got some big gains. And then for instance, Adobe Premiere Pro, they got a 25% gain in our final render times. And then I saw how they did that and it was with 8K footage. And I did raise this concern to AMD. I thought to myself, well, someone spending $30,000 plus on 8K camera gear is not gonna be using a gaming graphics card to uh, edit and render out footage. And so for me personally, I do 4K uh, workflow. And the recent video I did was a 20 minute render with the Darth Jar Jar build and I applied some Lumetri color effects, 10 band EQ, and the final uh, render times really didn't see a difference. Even a 1070 Ti was still punching up there uh, with the Vega 64 and the Radeon 7. I think if you wanna get the most out of Adobe Premiere Pro, for example, at the moment, then you definitely wanna think about using QuickSync. Anyway, guys, all this boils down to the recommendation and conclusion with Radeon 7. What do I think of this card? I think, honestly, for starters, it's a much better implementation of a reference card than Vega 64 and Vega 56 ever was. I really was unimpressed with those two cards when they launched. This here is decent. It's not mind-blowing performance, but it's a solid implementation of a graphics card from AMD. Uh, we'll start with the build quality for starters. They've got a cooler that is implemented well. It's implemented properly. It's got good display options at the rear. It's also got a very nice aesthetic as opposed to the previous reference cards that they released with the Vega 64 and 56. But in terms of stacking up against the competition, here's where things get a little bit tricky. And this is where my recommendation is gonna sway in two different ways, depending on your budget. And of course, you've got FreeSync 2 support, uh, but NVIDIA have recently updated their drivers to now have their graphics card support FreeSync monitors. So that's kind of not really a benefit anymore with AMD graphics cards solely and specifically. Uh, but in terms of the 16 gigabytes of HBM2, there is a purpose for it on this graphics card. It's not just to get the 16 gigabytes of, wow, we've got so much VRAM on board. It's actually implemented on this card to get performance increases. But in terms of the RTX 2070, I leave this on the desk here because it's probably going to be this or this, depending on what you want to go with. And you'll notice that there's no RTX 2080 here on the desk. And that's because when I first reviewed the RTX 2080, I wasn't really impressed with that card at all. I thought it was a step down from a 1080 Ti because you went from 11 gigabytes of VRAM down to eight gigabytes of VRAM. Uh, but then you got these features, RTX features that really didn't apply to many games. And even when they did apply, they were giving you performance hits or degradation in image quality. And so we're yet to still see the full benefits of RTX features from RTX graphics cards. But in terms of raw performance and value for money, I think this here is a good buy compared to the RTX 2080. I just don't think it's a good buy compared to the RTX 2070, especially when I know you can overclock this and get good performance figures out of it. This card here, the Radeon 7, is still up in the air in terms of overclocking and uh, driver's support. Because this graphics card here, I'm gonna come back in a month's time and take another look at it in terms of overclocking and also driver updates and see if we can extract more performance. Because I know over time, this numbers on the 2070 are slowly creeping up towards that of 1080 Ti levels, and it is slowly nudging ahead in some titles, especially when you overclock it. So what we've got here is a weird recommendation where I'd rather be buying an RX 570 at the bottom then I'd go to an RTX 2060, then I'd go to an RTX 2070, then I'd go to a Radeon 7, and then if I had a lot of money and I didn't care, I just wanted the best performance, then you've got the 2080 Ti. So $700, I actually think it's okay and it's a viable option, and that's because I think the RTX 2080 could have used more VRAM, and if they did put 11 gigabytes on the 2080 and uh, gave it maybe even a little bit more performance, my recommendation here today would probably be different. So AMD were pretty smart, I think, to go after the 2080 in a direct comparison to it and uh, sort of fill that price gap with the Radeon 7. But in terms of the 2070, this is coming in at 500 bucks. And when you overclock it, especially, it does come very close and sometimes beats it out in some titles as opposed to Radeon 7. And yes, this has got eight gigabytes, but at 1440p, I'm sure a lot of people would be buying this graphics card for 1440p because 
I actually don't know many people that play games at 4K, despite 4K benchmarks being very numerous. I think uh, 1440p high refresh rates and 1080p ultra, even 1080p. Anyway guys, this review has gone on and on. I really wanna know what you guys think in the comments about Radeon 7 and also RTX 2070 and 2080. Sort of this group of graphics cards is very interesting because I, in the past, I haven't come into this dilemma. And so do you think my recommendation is right? Do you think it's wrong? I do wanna revisit this Gravis card. And also the eight gigabytes of VRAM on the 2070 and 2080 versus the 16 gigabytes of HBM2. Let us know some tests that you guys would like to see with that in the comment section below. And I'll do a follow-up video with VRAM and an investigation because on Resident Evil 2, when I upped the uh, texture quality, and sort of made it go past this VRAM limit, it didn't change performance whatsoever. But I will be investigating that, so let us know in the comment section below what tests you wanna see. Also let us know what you think about Radeon 7 and my recommendation here today. Love reading your thoughts and opinions as always. And also if you enjoyed this video, then be sure to hit that like button. And if you wanna see the content the moment it drops, be sure to hit the sub button, turn the little bell on. And if you wanna get that inside scoop before it even gets to YouTube, Instagram's there for you, Tech Yes City. And I'll catch you guys in another tech video very soon. Peace out for now. Bye. Vega 64 flagship graphics card. Now, of course, or should I say Gravis card? Now, power consumption is Baby Maggie! Baby Maggie!